Hi everyone, this week we're going to look at psychological disorders and the therapeutic response to those disorders. Examining disordered behavior of course assumes that there's such a thing as ordered behavior, which we already know from looking at the content of this course is varied and different across different people. What we mean by psychologically disordered behavior is behavior that is deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional. Deviant behavior is behavior that some of you may have engaged in last week in the social norm violation. Simply things that are different than the normal behavior in given situations. That alone is not worthy of a psychological disorder. These behaviors must also be distressful. They must cause some psychological or physiological problem for the person engaged in the behavior. Something that's undesirable. And finally, these behaviors need to be dysfunctional. They need to cause some particular impediment or cause some dysfunction in the person's life. For example, someone in a primitive culture who has a terrible fear of flying may not have a psychological disorder because that fear of flying doesn't actually make their life any less functional than it would be previously because they don't have access to flight. In this video, we'll primarily focus on different types of disorders, but first we'll begin by talking about different psychological perspectives on disorders. I like to cover psychological disorders and therapy last because it really builds on our understanding of all of the different perspectives in psychological science. Just like those different perspectives have different thoughts on human thinking, feeling, and behavior, they also have different thoughts on disordered human thinking, feeling, and behavior, right? So these different perspectives approach different psychological disorders differently. I'd like you to spend some care with the textbook, looking at how these different perspectives approach psychological disorders. Think about just one, for example. Let's say a client expresses that they're having hallucinations. How might the biological perspective look at those hallucinations? Or, for instance, how might the psychodynamic perspective look at those hallucinations? Not only might the treatment differ dramatically, as we'll talk about in the next unit, but certainly the perspective on the disorder would be different. Whereas the cognitive perspective may be focused on the irrational nature of those hallucinations and trying to convince the individual that those hallucinations are false, the biological perspective may be seeking neural underpinnings of those disorders and attempt to treat them in that way. The perspective that we'll be adopting for most of the rest of the class is this integrated perspective that I've really been trying to foster all along what we call the biopsychosocial perspective. The idea that all three of these things, biological, psychological, and social influences, come together to produce those behaviors. From that perspective, clinical psychologists have attempted to categorize patterns of disordered thinking, feeling, and behaving. They do this for a variety of reasons. One is to make treatment of those disorders easier because it allows scientists treating and studying those disorders to understand what each other are talking about. It gives them a common language. We're going to use those categories developed by researchers and listed in the DSM-5 in order to understand some of these disorders. Let's begin by talking about anxiety disorders. Anxiety has been referred to as the plague of modernity. Anxiety is a consistent experience of activated sympathetic nervous system. From a cognitive perspective, it involves heightened worry and fear. From a physiological and biological perspective, chronically increased cortisol and other physiological markers of stress. Stress and anxiety are often totally normal responses to our everyday lives. Remember, in order for something to be disordered, it has to be deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional. So the anxiety has to be an abnormal response to a situation, deviant. It has to be distressful, as anxiety often is, and cause some discomfort in the individual. And it also has to be dysfunctional. It has to get in the way of that person's daily life and success. Anxiety disorders are a class of disorders under which several specific disorders fall. For example, generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorders deal with experiences of feelings of anxiety in inappropriate situations or at sort of inappropriate intensities. General anxiety disorder in particular is incredibly common, and many people experience generalized anxiety, heightened levels of sympathetic nervous system arousal, and chronic worry in our society. Phobias are another example of an anxiety disorder. A phobia is a specific deviant and dysfunctional response to some stimuli in the environment based in fear, a chronic and overreactive fear to some stimulus. Now remember, in order for something to be disordered, it has to be dysfunctional. So in order for you to have a phobia about something, that fear has to actively get in the way of your well-being. For example, many people don't like spiders. 
But for someone who's arachnophobic, the sight or even the idea of a spider can cause such a severe anxiety response that they're incapable of performing their normal daily duties. Obsessive compulsive disorder is also listed under the anxiety disorders. The reason that it's an anxiety disorder is that the obsessions, which are chronic and intrusive thoughts about a subject that are unwanted, and the compulsions, which are chronic and intrusive behaviors that are unwanted, are often motivated by a desire to reduce anxiety. That is, if I'm not engaging in my hand washing compulsion or my obsession about germs, I'm experiencing lots of anxiety about germs and infection. Obsessive compulsive disorder is often a reaction to a specific anxiety about a subject. The final group of anxiety disorders I want to mention is acute anxiety disorder and PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. These disorders revolve around people's response to a traumatic event. Stress, depression, and anxiety are completely normal responses to these events. However, when those responses are excessive or they last for an extended amount of time, they can become distressful and dysfunctional. Post-traumatic stress disorder in particular is an area of current research as we understand that many of our returning veterans suffer from PTSD and we work to provide treatment for those individuals. As I mentioned, anxiety disorders are incredibly common. The other very common class of disorders across the world are mood disorders. Mood disorders are deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional patterns of feeling, or affect. Affect comes in a valence and an intensity. So when we're talking about affect, we're talking about positive or negative mood, and we're talking about the strength of that mood. So I can have strong positive affect, or good, strong, happy feelings, and, or weak negative affect. The most common mood disorder is major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is an episode lasting more than six weeks where the person experiences a lack of interest in things that they once enjoyed and overall depressed or sad mood. There are a variety of other symptoms that come with depression. It's really a family of disorders that can often include physiological symptoms like a lack of sleep or an extensive amount of sleep, like the inability to eat or extensive overeating. And on the worst ends of the spectrum can also involve suicidal thoughts and even suicidal behaviors. Major depressive disorder is incredibly common. Over one third of college students will experience a major depressive episode during their college career. But its commonality does not mean that it's not incredibly distressing and dysfunctional and very dangerous. I hope that as a result of this unit, you'll be more aware of the symptoms of major depressive disorder both in yourself and in your peers, and that you'll work to help individuals who are experiencing those symptoms to seek the help that we're gonna talk about in the next unit. On the other side of mood disorders, are the positive affect disorders, like mania or bipolar disorder, which has aspects of both depression and mania. Mania is high affect, often coupled with a sense of indestructibility and uncontrollable impulses. Bipolar disorder includes both symptoms of depression and mania cyclically. Bipolar type one has full-blown depressive and manic episodes, where bipolar type two has depressive episodes coupled with hypomania, an experience of relative levity and increased mood that doesn't quite go all the way to a full-blown manic episode. Now that we've discussed the disorders that are relatively common in our population, we're gonna turn our attention to a few classes of disorders that are relatively rare, but that help us understand how the non-disordered mind works. Dissociative disorders are the disorders that are associated with the loss of the sense of self or a sense of identity or individuality. One of the most well-known dissociative disorders is dissociative identity disorder, formerly called multiple personality disorder. And there are many questions as to the validity of dissociative identity disorder as an independent diagnosis. I encourage you to look at that section in your textbook carefully. There are several documented experiences of dissociative amnesia and dissociative fugue, particularly in high stress situations. These are situations where a person often temporarily loses their sense of self or memory for recent or distal events. There's a classic example of someone attempting to fake a dissociative fugue in the television series Breaking Bad. But just because these disorders are relatively rare and poorly understood doesn't mean that temporary episodes do not happen, especially in cases, as I mentioned, of extreme stress. And understanding how that sense of self can be lost may help us understand what that sense of self is in the first place and in a non-disordered mind. The next disorder I'd like to talk about is schizophrenia. Also relatively rare, this disorder is often characterized by its positive symptoms. These are symptoms which you can sort of think of as additive. Things like delusions and hallucinations, things that are perceived but are not actually observable by anyone else. Like other disorders, schizophrenia is actually a family of symptoms. 
And in fact, there are several subtypes of schizophrenia that involve primarily negative symptoms, like catatonia and muscle control problems. Schizophrenia is characterized primarily by cognitive impairment, an inability to organize the way that the world is viewed and also presented. But if you looked at schizophrenia from a biological perspective, you would notice that people who are diagnosed as schizophrenics post-mortem have larger vesicles in the brain. These are the fluid-filled areas in the center of the brain. The increased size of the vesicles in the schizophrenic's brain, coupled with a decrease in white matter, means that there are some neurological differences that might be responsible for or responsive to the cognitive problems. Schizophrenia, like other psychological disorders we've discussed in this unit, is rather heritable, and twin studies have helped us reveal that heritable component. Finally, we'll take a moment to discuss personality disorders. Personality disorders are characteristic ways of viewing the self or others that are deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional. Some of the characteristic personality disorders are things like paranoid personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. I've included the Joker here as an example of an antisocial personality. Antisocial personality has a characteristic lack of empathy, often relatively flat affect or emotion, and often the ability to manipulate through charisma. Antisocial personality disorder is relatively rare but is a really interesting insight into how critical the social ties that bind us are to helpful functioning within an environment. What's most interesting about these psychological disorders is how we can view them from different perspectives in order to approach the treatment from different perspectives as well. The next unit will focus on treatment.